All right, here we go. Welcome back to DJX. Please bear with me though. I can't edit the middle of the video. So if I make any mistakes, that's how it's going to be. This is the most dangerous game by Richard Connell. It's going to be a dangerous read through. Let's just say that. Off there to the right somewhere is a large island, said Whitney. It's rather a mystery. What island is it? Rainsford asked. The old charts call it Ship Trap Island, Whitney replied. A suggestive name, isn't it? Sailors have a curious dread of the place. I don't know why. Some superstition. Can't see it, remarked Rainsford, trying to peer through the dark tropical night that was palpable as it pressed its thick, warm blackness in upon the yacht. You've got good eyes, said Whitney, with a laugh. And I've seen you pick off a moose moving in a brown fall bush at 400 yards. But even you can't see four miles or so through a moonless Caribbean night. Nor four yards, admitted Rainsford. Ugh, it's like moist black velvet. It will be a light enough in Rio, promised Whitney. We should make it in a few days. I hope the Jaguar guns have come from Purdy's. We should have some good hunting up in the Amazon. Great sport, hunting. The best sport in the world, agreed Rainsford. For the hunter, admit, um, amended Whitney, not for the jaguar. Don't talk rot, Whitney, said rot, uh, Rainsford. You're a big game hunter, not a philosopher. Who cares how a jaguar feels? Perhaps the jaguar does, observed Whitney. Bah, you've no, they've no understanding. Even so, I rather think they understand one thing, fear. The fear of pain and the fear of death. Nonsense, laughed Rainsford. This hot weather is making you soft, Whitney. Be a realist. The world is made up of two classes. The hunter and the huntees. Luckily, you and I are hunters. Do you think we're... Uh, we've passed the island yet? I can't tell in the dark. I hope so. Why? asked Rainsford. The place has a reputation. A bad one. Cannibals. Oh, er, oh. cannibals? suggested Rainsford. Hardly. Even cannibals wouldn't live in such a godforsaken place. But it's gotten into sailor lore somehow. Didn't you notice that the crew's nerves uh, seemed a bit jumpy today? They were a very, bit strange now that you mention it. Even Captain Nelson. Yes, even that tough-minded old Swede. We, uh, who'd go up to the devil himself and ask for a light. Those fishy blue eyes held a look I never saw there before. All I could get out of him was, this place has an evil name among seafaring men, sir. Then he said to me, very gravely, don't you feel anything? As if the air about us was actually poisonous. Now, you mustn't laugh when I tell you this. I did feel something like a sudden chill. There was no breeze. The sea was as flat as a plate glass window. We were drawing near the island then. When I, uh, what I felt was a, a mental chill, a sort of sudden dread. Pure imagination, said Rainsford. One superstitious sailor can taint the whole ship's company with his fear. Maybe, but sometimes I think sailors have an extra sense that tells them when they are in danger. Sometimes I think evil is a tangible thing with wavelengths, just as sound and light have. An evil place uh, can, so to speak, broadcast vibrations of evil. Anyhow, I'm glad we're getting out of this zone. Well, I think I'll turn in now, Rainsford. <clears throat> I'm not sleepy, said Rainsford. I'm going to smoke another pipe on the after deck. Good night, then, Rainsford. I'll see you at breakfast. Right. Good night, Whitney. There was no sound in the night as Rainsford sat there, but the muffled throb of the engine that drove the yacht swiftly through the darkness. 
and the swish and ripple of the waves of the propeller, or wash of the propeller. Rainsford reclined in his steamer chair, indolently puffed on his favorite briar. The sensuous drowsiness of the night was on him. It's so dark, he thought, that I could sleep without closing my eyes. The night would be my eyelids. An abrupt sound startled him. Off to the right he heard it, and his ears, expert in such matters, could not be mistaken. Again he heard the sound, and again, somewhere off in the blackness, someone had fired a gun three times. Rainsford uh, sprang up and moved quickly to the rail, mystified. He strained his eyes in the direction from which the reports had come, but it was like trying to see through a blanket. He leapt onto the rail and balanced himself there to get greater elevation. His pipe, striking a rope, was knocked from his mouth. He lunged for it. A short, hoarse cry came from, he lips, from his lips as he realized he had reached too far and lost his balance. The cry was pinched off short as the warm, oh, blood-warm waters of the Caribbean Sea do or doused over his head. He struggled up to the surface and tried to cry out, but the wash from the speeding yacht slapped him in the face and the salt water in his open mouth made him gag and strangle. Desperately, he struck out with strong strokes after the receding lights of the yacht, but he stopped before he had swung fifty feet. A certain cool-headedness had come to him. It was not the first time he had been in a tight place. There was a chance that his cries could be heard by someone aboard the yacht, but that chance was slender, and grew more slender as the yacht raced on. He wrestled himself out of his clothes and shouted with all of his power. Uh, the lights of the yacht became faint in ever-vanishing fireflies, then they were blotted out entirely by the night. Rainsford remembered the shots, that they had come from the right, and dogged, uh, doggedly he swam in that direction. Swimming with slow, deliberate strokes, conserving his energy. For a seemingly endless time, he fought the sea. He began to count his strokes. He could do possibly a hundred, more and uh, more, and then Rainsford heard a sh sound. It came from out of the darkness, a high screaming sound, the sound of an animal in an ex uh, extremity of anguish and terror. He did not recognize the animal that made the sound. He did not try uh, to, with fresh vitality, he swam toward the sound. He heard it again. Then it was cut short by another noise, crisp, staccato, pistol shot, murmured Rainsford, swimming on. Ten minutes of determined effort brought another sound to his ear, the most welcome he had ever heard, the mutter uh, muttering and growling of the sea breaking on a rocky shore. He was almost on the rocks before he saw them. On a night less calm, he would have been shattered against them. With his remaining strength, he dragged himself from the swirling water. Jagged crags appeared to jut out into the opaqueness. He forced himself upward, hand over hand, gasping, his hands raw. He reached a flat place at the top. Dense jungle came down to the very edge of the cliff. What perils that tangle of trees and underbrush might hold for him did not concern Rainsford just then. All he knew was that he was safe from his enemy, the sea. And that utter weariness was on him. He flung himself down at the jungle edge and tumbled headlong into the deepest sleep of his life. When he opened his eyes, he knew from the position of the sun that it was late in the afternoon. Sleep had given him new vigor. A sharp hunger was picking at him. He looked about him almost cheerfully. Were there, uh, Where there are pistol shots, there are men. 
Where there are men, there is food, he thought. But what kind of men, he wondered, in so forbidding a place? An unbroken front of snarled and ragged jungle fringed the shore. He saw no sign of a trail through the closely knit web of weeds and trees. It was easier to go along the shore, and Rainsford floundered a along by the water, not far from where he had landed. He stopped. Some wounded thing, by the evidence, a large animal had thrashed about in the underbrush. The jungle weeds were crushed down by the moss. Was oh oh. <clears throat> Weeds were crushed down and the moss was lacerated. One path of weeds was stained crimson. A small, glittering object not far away caught Rainsford eyes, uh, Rainsford's eye, and he picked it up. It was an empty cartridge. A twenty-two, he remarked. That's odd. It must have been a fairly large animal, too. The hunter had some nerve with him to tackle it with a light gun. It's clear that the brute put up a fight. I suppose the first three shots I heard was when the hunter flushed his query and wounded it. The last shot was where he trailed it here and finished it. He examined the ground closely and found what he had hoped to find. The print of hunting boots. They pointed along the cliff in the direction he had been going. Eagerly, he hurried along. Now slipping on a rotten log or a loose stone but making headway. Night was beginning to settle down on the island. Bleak darkness was blacking out the sea in the jungle when Rainsford sighted the lights. He came upon them as he turned a crook in the coastline, and his first thought was that he had come up to a village, for there were many lights. But as he forged along, he saw to his great astonishment that all the lights were in one enormous building. A lofty structure which point, with pointed towers, plunging upward into the gloom. His eyes made out the shadowy outlines of a, a palatial chateau. It was set on a high bluff, and on three sides of its cliffs dived down to where the sea licked greedily, lips in the shadows. Mirage, thought Rainsford, but it was no mirage he found when he opened the tall spiked iron gate. The stone steps were real enough. The massive door with a leering gargoyle for a knocker was real enough, yet above it all hung an air of unreality. He lifted the knocker, and it creaked up stiffly, as if it had never been used. He let it fall, and it startled him when its booming loudness. He thought he heard steps within. The door remained closed. Again, Rainsford lifted the heavy knocker and let it fall. The door opened then, opened as suddenly as if it were on a spring, and Rainsford stood blinking in the river of glaring gold light that poured in. The first thing Rainsford's eyes discerned was the largest man Rainsford had ever seen, a gigantic creature solidly made and black-bearded to the waist. In his hand, the man had a long-barreled revolver, and he was pointing it straight at Rainsford's heart. Out of a snarl of beard, two eyes, oh, two small eyes, uh, regarded Rainsford. Don't be alarmed, said Rainsford, with a smile, which he hoped was disarming. I'm no robber. I fell off of a yacht. My name is Sanger, Rainsford, of New York. That's an odd name. Anyway, the menacing look in his eyes did not change. The revolver pointing as rigidly as if the giant were a statue. He gave no sign that he understood Rainsford's words, or that he even heard them. He was dressed in uniform, a black uniform trimmed with gray astrakhan. Whatever that is. I'm Sanger Rainsford of New York, Rainsford began again. I fell off a yacht. I am hungry. The man's only answer was to raise his thumb to the hammer of his revolver. Then Rainsford saw the man's free hand go for his forehead 
in a military salute, and he saw him click his heels together and stand at attention. Another man was coming down the broad marble steps, an erect slender man, in his evening clothes. He advanced to Rainsford and held out his hand. In a cultivated voice, marked by a slight accent that gave it added precision and deliberateness, he said, It is a great pleasure and honor to welcome Mr. Sanger Rainsford, the celebrated hunter to my home. Automatically, Rainsford shook the man's hand. I've read your book about hunting snow leopards in Tibet, you see, explained the man. I am General Zaroff. Rainsford's first impression was that the man was singularly handsome. His second was that there was an organ or original, almost bizarre quality about the a vivid white oops <clears throat> about the general's face. He was a tall man past middle age, for his hair was a vivid white, but his thick eyebrows and pointed military mustache were as black as the night from which Rainsford had come. His eyes, too, were black and very bright. He had high cheekbones and sharp-cut nose, a spare, dark face, the face of a man used, used to giving orders, the face of an aristocrat. Turning to the giant in uniform, the gen general made a sign. The giant put away his pistol saluted and withdrew. Ivan is an incredibly strong fellow, remarked the general, but he has the misfortune of being deaf and dumb. A simple fellow, but I'm afraid, like all his race, a bit of a savage. Is he a Russian? He is Cossack, uh, said the general, and his smile showed red lips and pointed teeth. So am I. Come, he said. We shouldn't be chatting here. We can talk later. Now, you want clothes, food, rest? You shall have them. This is a most restful spot. Ivan had reappeared, and the general spoke to him with lips that moved but gave forth no sound. Follow Ivan, if you please, Mr. Rainsford, said the general. I was about to have my dinner when you came. I'll wait for you. You'll find that my clothes will fit you, I think. It was to a huge beam ceiling bedroom with a canopied bed, big enough for six men, that Rainsford followed the silent giant. Ivan laid out an evening suit, and Rainsford, as he put it on, noticed that it came from a London tailor, who ordinarily cut in sewed for none below the rank of Duke. <clears throat> The dining room to which Ivan conducted him was in many ways remarkable. There was a medieval mo magnificence about it. It suggested a baronial hall and feudal times with its oaken panels, its high ceiling, its vast reflectory tables, and two score men could sit down to eat. About the hall were mounted heads of many animals, lions, tigers, elephants, Moose, bears, larger, and more perfect specimens. Rainsford had never seen at the great table the general was sitting alone. You'll have a cocktail, Mr. Rainsford, he suggested. The cocktail was surprisingly good, and Rainsford noted, noted the table appointments were of the finest. The linen, the crystals, the silver, the china. They were eating borscht. The rich red soup with whipped cream, so dear to Russian palates. Half apologetically, General Zarov said, We do our best to preserve the amenities of civilization here. Please forgive my lapses. We are well off the beaten track, you know. Did you think the champagne was or had suffered from its long ocean trip? Not in the least, declared Rainsford. He was finding the general a most thoughtful and alf, uh, affable host. Affable. Oops. A true cosmopolite. 
But there was one small trait of the generals that made Rainsford uncomfortable. Whenever he looked up from his plate, oops, whenever he looked up from his plate, he found the general studying him, appraisingly him or appraising him narrowly. Perhaps, said General Zaroff, you were surprised that I recognized your name. You see, I read all books on hunting published in English, French, and Russian. I have put one passion in my life, Mr. Rainsford, and it is the hunt. I have no idea why it divided Rainsford like that. It said Rains, period, Ford. Anyway, you have some wonderful heads here, said Rainsford, as he ate a particularly well-cooked filet mignon. The Cape Buffalo is the largest I ever saw. Oh, that fellow. Yes, he was a monster. Did he charge you? Hurtled me against the tree, said the general. Fractured my skull, but I got the brute. I've always thought, said Rainsford, that the Cape Buffalo is the most dangerous of all big game. Rainsford expressed his surprise. Oh, oops. For a moment, the general did not reply. He was smiling, his curious red-lipped smile. Then he said slowly, No, you are wrong, sir. The Cape Buffalo is not the most dangerous big game. He sipped his wine. Here in my preserve, on this island, he said in the same slow tone, I hunt the most dangerous game. Rainsford expressed his surprise. Is there big game on this island? The general nodded. The biggest. Really? Oh, it isn't here naturally, of course. I have to stock the island. What have you imported, General? Rainsford asked. Tigers? The general smiled. No, he said. Hunting tigers ceased to interest me some years ago. I exhausted their possibilities, you see. No thrill left in tigers. No real danger. I live for danger, Mr. Rainsford. The general took from his pocket a gold cigarette case and offered his black guest a long black cigarette with a silver tip. It was perfumed and gave off a very nice smell, almost like incense. <clears throat> we will have some capital hunting, you and I, said the general. I shall be most glad to have your society. But what game, began Rainsford. I'll tell you, said the general. You'll be most amused. I know, I think I may say in all modesty that I have done a rare thing. I have invented a new sensation. May I pour you another glass of port? Thank you, General. The General filled both glasses and said, God makes some men poets, some he makes kings, some beggars. Me, he made a hunter. His hand was made for the tiger. Oh, my hand was made for the trigger. My father said, um, he was a rich man with a quarter million or quarter of a million acres in the Crimea, or in Crimea, and he was an ardent sportsman. When I was only five years old, he gave me a little gun, specifically made in Moscow, Moscow for me, to shoot sparrows with. When I shot some of his prized turkeys with it, he did not punish me. He complimented me on my marksmanship. I killed my first bear in the Caucasus when I was ten. My whole life has been one prolonged hunt. I went into the army. It was expected of noblemen's sons, and for a time commanded a division of Cossack cavalry. But my real interest was always the hunt. I have hunted every kind of game in every land. It would be impossible for me to tell you how many animals I have killed. The general puffed on his cigarette. After the debacle in Russia, I left the country. 
for it was most imprudent for an officer of the Tsar to stay there. Many noble Russians lost everything. I, luckily, had invested heavily in American securities, so I shall never have to open a tea room in Monte Cristo or drive a taxi in Paris. Naturally, I continued to hunt. Grizzlies, or grizzliest in your, or grizzlies in your Rockies, crocodiles in the Ganges, rhinoceroses in East Africa. It was in Africa that the Cape Buffalo hit me and laid me up for six months. As soon as I recovered, I started for the Amazon to hunt jaguars. For I had heard they were unusually cunning. They weren't the Kasak side. They were no match at all for a hunter with his wits about him, and a high-powered rifle. It was bitterly, I was bitterly disappointed. I was laying in my tent with a splitting headache one night when a terrible thought pushed its way into my mind. Hunting was beginning to bore me, and hunting, remember, had been my life. I have heard that in America, businessmen often go to uh, pieces, um, oh, pieces when they give up the business that has been their life. Yes, that's so, said Rainsford. The general smiled. I have no wish to go to pieces, he said. I must do something. Now, mine is an analytical mind, Mr. Rainsford. Doubtless, this is why I enjoy the problems of the chase. No doubt, General Zarov. So, continued the general, I asked myself why the hunt no longer fascinated me. You are much younger than I am, Mr. Rainsford, and have not hunted as much. But you perhaps can guess the answer. What was it? Simply this. Hunting had ceased to be what you call a sporting proposition. It had become too easy. I always got my query. Always. There is no greater bore than perfection. The general lit a fresh cigarette. No animal had a chance with me anymore. That is no boast. It is a mathematical certainty. The animal had nothing but his legs and his instinct. Instinct is no match for reason. When I thought of this, it was a tragic moment for me. I can tell you. Rainsford leaned across the table absorbed in what his host was saying. It came to me as an inspiration, what I must do. The general went on. And that was? The general smiled the quiet smile of one who, was, who has faced an obstacle and surmounted it with success. I had to invent a new animal to hunt, he said. A new animal? You're joking. Not at all, said the general. I never joke about hunting. I needed a new animal, so I found one. So I bought uh, bought this island, built this house, and here I do my hunting. The island is perfect for my purposes. These jungles are a maze of trail uh, traits in... Oh. There are jungles with a maze of traits in them, hills, swamps, but the animal, General Zaroff. Oh, said the general, it supplies me with the most exciting hunt in the world. No other hunting compares with it for an, in, for an instant. Every day I hunt, and I never grow bored now, for I have a quarry with which I can match my wits. Rainsford's bewilderment showed in his face. I wanted the ideal animal to hunt, explained the general. So I said, what are the attributes of an ideal query? And the answer was, of course, it must have courage, cunning, and above all, it must be able to reason. But no animal can reason, objected Rainsford. My dear fellow, said the general, there is one that can. But you can't mean, gasped Rainsford. And why not? I can't believe you're serious, General Zaroff. 
This is a grisly joke. Why should I not be serious? I'm speaking of hunting. Hunting? Great guns, General Zaroff. What you are speaking of is, it's murder. The general laughed with entire good nature. He regarded Rainsford quizzically. I refuse to believe that so modern and civilized a young man as you seem to be harbors romantic ideas about the value of human life. Surely your experiences in the war did not make me condone cold-blooded murder, uh, finished Rainsford stiffly. Laughter shook the general. How extraordinarily dull you are, he said. One does not expect nowadays to find a young man of educated class, even in America, with such a naive, and if I may say so, mid-Victorian point of view. It's like finding a snuff-box in a limousine. Ah, oh, well, doubtless you had Puritan ancestors. So many Americans appear to have had. I'll wager you'll forget your notions when you go hunting with me. You've genuine new thrill in store for you, Mr. Rainsford. Thank you, I'm a hunter, not a murderer. Dear me, said the general, quite unruled, unruffled. Again, that unpleasant word. But I think I can show you that my scruples are quite ill-founded. Yes? Life is for the strong, to be lived by the strong, and if needs be, taken by uh, the strong. To win, sorry, began Rainsford huskily. I'll cheerfully acknowledge my self-defeat if I do not find you by midnight of the third day, said General Zaroff. My sloop will place you on the mainland near a town. The general read what Rainsford was thinking. Oh, you can trust me, said the Cossack. I will give you my word as a gentleman and a sportsman. Of course, you in turn must agree to say nothing of what of your visit here. I'll agree to nothing of the kind, said Rainsford. Oh, said the general. In that case. But why discuss this now? Three days hence, we can discuss it over a bottle of Valve uh, Clectoqua. Unless, the general sipped his wine. Then a business like air animated him. Ivan, he said to Rainsford, will supply you with hunting clothes. Food a knife. I suggest you wear moccasins. They leave a poorer trail. I suggest, too, that you avoid the big swamp in the southeast corner of the island. We call it Death Swamp. There's quicksand there. One foolish fellow tried it. The deplorable part of it was that the that Lazarus, uh, Lazarus followed him. You can imagine my feelings, Mr. Rainsford. I loved Lazarus. He was my favorite hound in my pack. Well, I must beg you to excuse me now. I always take a siesta after lunch. You'll hardly have time for a nap, I fear. You'll want to start, no doubt. I shall not follow till dusk. Hunting at night is so much more exciting than by day. Don't you think? Au revoir, said Mr. Rainsford. Au revoir. General Zaroff, with a deep courtly bow, strolled from the room. From another door came Ivan. Under one arm, he carried khaki hunting clothes, a haver sack of food, a leather sheath containing a long-bladed hunting knife. His right hand rested on a, on a cocked revolver, thrust in the crimson sash of his waist. Rainsford had... Uh, fought his way through the brush for two hours. I must keep my nerve, I must keep my nerve, he said through tight teeth. He had not been entirely clear-headed when the chateau gate snapped shut behind him. The whole idea at first was to put distance between himself and General Zaroff. And to this end, he had plunged along, 
spurred on by the sharp roars of something very like panic. Now he had got a grip on himself, had stopped, and was taking stock of himself in the situation. He saw that straight flight was futile. Inevitably, it would bring him face to face with the sea. He was in a picture with a frame of water, and his Operations clearly must take place within that frame. I'll give him a trail to follow, murmured Rainsford, and he struck off with the rude path he had been following into the trackless wilderness. He executed a series of intricate loops. He doubled on, on his trail again and again, recalling all the lore of the fox hunt and all the dodges of the fox. Night found him weary legs. With hands and face lashed by the branches on a thickly wooded ridge, he knew it would be insane to blunder on through the dark, even if he had the strength. His need for rest was imperative, and he thought, I have played the fox, now I must play the cat in the fable. A big tree with a thick trunk and outspread branches was nearby, and taking care to leave not the slightest mark. He climbed up into the crotch and straight out on one of the branch limbs, or broad limbs. After a fashion, rested. Rest brought him new confidence and almost a feeling of security. Even so, zealous a hunter as General Zaroff could not trace him there, he told himself. Only the devil himself could follow that complicated trail through the jungle after dark. But perhaps the general was the devil. An apprehensive night crawled slowly by like a wounded snake, and sleep did not visit Rainsford. Although the silence of a dead world was on the jungle, toward morning, when a dense gray was van varnished the sky, varnishing the sky, the cry of something was coming through the bush, coming slowly, carefully coming by the same winding way Rainsford had come. He flattened himself down on a limb, and through a screen of leaves, almost as thick as tapestry, he watched. That which was approaching was a man. It was General Zaroff. He made his way along with his eyes fixed in utmost concentration on the ground before him. He paused, almost beneath the tree, dropped to his knees and studied the ground. Rainsford's impulse was to hurl himself down like a panther, but he saw that the general's right hand held something metallic, a small automatic pistol. The hunter shook his head several times as if he were puzzled. Then he straightened up and took from his case one of his black cigarettes. Its pungent incense-like smoke floated up to Rainsford's nostrils. Rainsford held his breath. The general's eyes had left the ground and were traveling inch by inch up the tree. Rainsford froze there, every muscle tensed for a spring. But the sharp eyes of the hunter stopped before they reached the limb where Rainsford was. A smile spread over his brown face. Very deliberately, he blew a smoke ring into the air. Then he turned his back on the tree and walked carelessly away. Back along the trail he had come. The swish of the underbrush against his hunting boots grew fainter and fainter. The pent-up air burst hotly from Rainsford's lungs. His thought uh, made him feel sick and numb. The general could follow a trail through the woods at night. He could follow an extremely difficult trail. He must have uncanny powers. Only by the merest chance had the Cossack failed to see his query. Rainsford's second thought was even more terrible. It sent a shudder of cold horror through his whole being. Why had the general smiled? Why had he turned back? Rainsford did not want to believe what his reason told him was true. But the truth was as evident as the sun that had by now pushed through the morning mists. The general was playing with him. 
The general was saving him for another day's sport. The cassock was the cat. He was the mouse. Then it was that Rainsford knew the full meaning of terror. I will not lose my nerve. I will not. He slid down from the tree and struck off again into the woods. His face was set, and he forced uh, the machinery of his mind to function. Three hundred yards from his hiding place, he stopped where a huge dead tree leaned precariously on a smaller living one. Throwing off his sack of food, Rainsford took his knife from his sheath and began to work with all of his energy. The job was finished at last. He threw himself down behind a fallen log and a hundred feet away. He did not have to wait long. The cat was coming again to play with the mouse. Following the trail with the sureness of a bloodhound came General Zaroff. Nothing escaped those searching black eyes. No crushed blade of grass, no bent twig, no mark, no matter how faint, in the moss. So intent was the cassock on his stalking that he was upon the thing. Rainsford hadn't made before he saw it. His foot, foot touched a protruding trigger bow that was uh, stretched a protruding bow that was the trigger. Even as he touched it, the general sensed his danger and leapt back with the agility of an ape. But he was not quite quick enough. The dead tree de delicately adjusted the, to rest on the cut living one crushed down, and struck the general a glancing blow on the shoulder as it fell. But for his alertness, he must have been smashed beneath it. He staggered, but did not fall, nor did he drop his revolver. He stood there, rubbing his injured shoulder and Rainsford with fear again, gripping his heart, heard the general's mocking laugh ring through the jungle. Rainsford, called the general, if you are within sound of my voice, as I suppose you are, let me congratulate you. Not many men know how to make a Malay man, man catcher. Luckily for me, I too have hunted in Malacca. You are proving interesting, Mr. Rainsford. I am going now to have my wound dressed. It's only a slight one. But I shall be back. I shall be back. When the general, nursing his bruised shoulder, had gone, Rainsford took up his fighting flight again. It was flight now, a desperate, hopeless flight, that carried him on for some hours. Dusk came, then darkness, and still he pressed on. The ground grew softer up under his moccasins. The vegetation grew ranker. Denser insects bit him savagely. Then, as he stepped forward, his foot sunk into the ooze. He tried to wrench it back, but the muck sucked viciously at his foot, as if it were a giant leech. With a violent effort, he tore his foot loose. He knew where he was now. Death Swamp and its quicksand. His hands were tight-closed, as if his nerve... Uh, were something tangible that someone in the darkness was trying to tear from his grip. The softness of the earth had given him an idea. He stepped back from the quicksand, a dozen feet or so, and, like some huge prehistoric beaver, he began to dig. Rainsford had dug himself in, in France, when a second's delay meant death. That had been a placid, taste. A uh, pastime compared with his digging now. The pit grew deeper. When it was about his shoulders, he climbed out and from some hard saplings cut stakes and sharpened them to a fine point. These stakes he flattened in the bottom of the pit with the points sticking up. With flying fingers, he wove a rough carpet of weeds and branches and with it, he covered the mouth of the pit. Then, Wet with sweat and aching with tenderness, he crouched behind the stump of a lightning-charred tree. He knew his pursuer was coming. He heard the padding sound of his feet on soft earth. The night breeze brought him the perfume of the general's cigarette. 
It seems to Rainsford that the general was coming with unusual swiftness. He was not feeling his way along, foot by foot. Rainsford, crouching there, could not see the general, nor could he see the pit. He lived a year in a minute. Then he felt an impulse to cry aloud with joy, for he heard the sharp crackle of the breaking branches as the cover of the pit gave way. He heard the sharp scream of pain as the pointed stakes found their mark. He leapt up from his pace of place of concealment. Then he cowered back. Three feet from the pit, a man was standing with an erect torch in his hand. You've done well, Rainsford, the voice of the general called. Your Burmese tiger pit has claimed one of my best dogs. Again, you score. I think, Mr. Rainsford, you'll see that you can do against my whole pack. Oh, I'll see what you can do against my whole pack. I'm going home for a rest now. Thank you for a most amusing evening. At daybreak, Rainsford, lying near the swamp, was awakened by a sound that made him know that he had new things to learn, or new things to learn about fear. It was a distant sound, faint and wavering, but he knew it. It was the baying of a pack of hounds. Rainsford knew that he could do one of two things. He could stay where he was and wait. That was suicide. He could flee. That was postponing the inevitable. For a moment, he stood there, thinking. An idea that held a wild chance came to him. And tightening his belt, he headed away from the swamp. The baying of the hounds drew nearer. Then still nearer, nearer, ever nearer, on a ridge, Rainsford climbed a tree. Down a water course, not a quarter mile away, he could see the bush moving. Straining his eyes, he saw the lean figure of General Zaroff just ahead of him. Rainsford made out another figure whose wide shoulders surged through the tall jungle weeds. It was the giant Ivan, and he seemed pulled forward by an unseen force. Rainsford knew that Ivan must be holding the pack in leash. They would be on him any minute now. His mind worked frantically. He thought of a native trick he had learned in Uganda. He slid down the tree. He caught hold of a springy young sapling, and to it he fastened his hunting knife. With the blade pointing down a trail, with a bit of wild grapevine, he tied back the sapling. Then he ran for his life. The hounds raised their voices as they hit the fresh scent. Rainsford knew now how the animal at bay feels. He had to stop to get his breath. The baying of the hound stopped abruptly, and Rainsford's heart stopped too. They must have reached the knife. He shined excitedly up a tree and looked back. His pursuers had stopped, but the hope that was in Rainsford's brain when he climbed died. For he saw in the Shadow Valley that General Zaroff was still on his feet. But Ivan was not. The knife driven by the recoil of the springing tree had not wholly failed. Rainsford had hardly tumbled to the ground when the pack took up the cry again. Nerve! 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 he panted as he dashed along. A blue gap showed between the trees dead ahead. Even nearer drew the hound. Rainsford forced himself toward the gap. He reached it. It was the shore of the sea. Across a cove, he could see the gloomy gray stones of the chateau. Twenty-five feet below him, the sea rumbled and hissed. Rainsford hesitated. He heard the hounds. Then he leapt far out into the sea. When the general and his pack reached the place by the sea, the Cossacks stopped. For some minutes, he stood regarding the blue-green expanse of water. He shrugged his shoulders. Then, B sat down, took a drink of brandy from a silver flask, lit a cigarette, and hummed for a bit from Madame Butterfly. 
General Zaroff had an exceedingly good dinner in his great paneled dinner or dining hall that evening. With it, he had a bottle of Paul Roger and half of a bottle of Chamberton. Two slight annoyances kept him from perfect enjoyment. One was the thought that it would be difficult to replace Ivan. The other was that his query had escaped him. Of course the American hadn't played the game, so the general, as he tasted his after-dinner liqueur, in his library he read, to soothe himself, from the works of Marcus Aureolus. At ten, he went to his bedroom. He was deliciously tired, he said to himself, as he locked himself in there. Oh, in. There was a slight moonlight. So, before turning on the light, he went to the window and looked down at the courtyard. He could see the great hounds, and he called, Better luck another time to them. Then he switched on the light. A man who had been hiding in the curtains of the bed was standing there. Rainsford, screamed the general. How in God's name did you get here? Swam, said Rainsford. I found it quicker than walking through the jungle. The general sucked in his breath and smiled. I congratulate you. He said, oh, he said, you have won the game. Rainsford did not smile. I am still a beast at bay, he said in a low, hoarse voice. Get ready, General Zaroff. The general made one of his deepest bows. I see, he said. Splendid. One of us is to furnish the repast, a repast for the hounds. The other will sleep in this very excellent bed. On guard, Rainsford. He had never slept in a better bed, Rainsford decided. All right, after all that, he killed General Zaroff. Thank you so much for watching the video, and um, I really hope you made it this far. Bye.